What's the hardest game of the 21st century that you've ever played? Is it one of the Souls games? Bloodborne? Sekiro? Is it Super Meat Boy or Celeste? Shovel Knight? Cuphead? Or The Binding of Isaac? Hollow Knight? Unless there are some obscure titles out there I haven't heard about, I think one of the hardest and maybe hardest modern game out there is right here, the procedurally generated 2D platformer roguelike dungeon crawler Spelunky 2. Or I guess let's leave the dramatic stuff at the door and say this is the game that's hardest for me of those that I've played so far. No matter how much I tried, I just couldn't beat this game for months. It was embarrassing. How in the world can I only beat a roguelite where the RNG isn't that extreme and you should be able to eventually master the game after literally 650 runs or 70 hours of playing. That's about as much as I played Spelunky 1, period. Yes, as you might have guessed, there is also Spelunky 1. Well, there's Spelunky 1 and then there's Spelunky HD, which is somewhat of a remake. Better graphics, some extra areas and monsters, and kind of different physics. All the games were made by Derek Yu, but I haven't played classics, so I won't be speaking about it. What I have played a lot of is Spelunky HD, which came out all the way back in 2008. I'll be calling it Spelunky 1 throughout this video, it's been decided. In Spelunky 1, you have health and levels to go through before you reach the boss. You have bombs to blow shit up with and ropes to climb, you can whip and throw things, you get items and so on. I haven't booted it up in years, but it's one of the most addictive and also unique for its time games ever. It executes procedurally generated levels in a way that not many games had done before. Every level felt intentionally designed and, simply put, not random. You couldn't get stuck if you didn't have enough bombs or ropes, as long as you avoided making dumb mistakes. You didn't have to sacrifice health because of the AI designing the level poorly, pretty much every death you suffered was due to your own fault. The game was just as fair as it was annoyingly difficult. And yet, going back to that game today after playing Spelunky 2 is honestly shocking. Why is everything so open and clearly in view and predictable? Why are there only 4 enemies on this level? In fact, why is the game so short? How was this hard for me? You see, Spelunky 2 came out in 2020, and it is not like this. Of course, it has superior graphics, more levels and bosses, more items and so on, but it's also much, much more difficult. And you know what's not difficult? Subbing, ringing the bell, liking, commenting, sharing and watching my other videos if you're interested. Anyway, first of all, this game mostly feels like either claustrophobia or the opposite, agoraphobia. You can't just be comfortable, no, that'd be too relaxing. Let's take the claustrophobia. On its own, it giving you a little space to navigate through the level isn't difficult, but it is when you have a thousand different threats to worry about. Look at this starting area, the dwelling. This is one of the few mandatory zones, you have no choice but to go to its four levels, and I kid you not when I say it's my most hated area in any game ever. It wasn't enough to have the simple snakes, spiders and bats, but now we're also adding moles. Fuck the moles, okay? They run around at supersonic speeds and although you can mostly predict when and where they'll jump out the ground after playing the game for a good while, they still do it at the worst possible time. And it's not like you can wait each one out and kill them individually when you only have 3 minutes on each level. They're a great addition, another way to make the floor even more crowded without pushing it too far since they're underground. Having enemies as aggressive and quick as the moles above ground might be too ridiculous. But why stop there? Why not also add the horned lizards? The moment they see you, these guys will start rolling and not stop unless they meet a wall or get hit with something that is in your whip. And guess what? This is one of the platformers where you can change directions in the air and every single movement can be incredibly precise. To demonstrate, this jump is actually possible and you can do it somewhat consistently if you're good enough. It's like Super Meat Boy or Hollow Knight if you've ever played those in the gems. And no, you shouldn't give me that power when it comes to movement, because with it comes the responsibility of not jumping one pixel to the right and landing next to the lizard instead of on top of it, which then makes it roll and take me for a trip throughout the whole cave before pushing me onto some spikes. <sighs> 
The same thing with jumping next to and not on top of an enemy also happens with the skeletons. They are passive until you approach them, then they get up and kind of pace left and right slowly. They are very weak. But here's the catch, not all of these piles of bones are alive and they are everywhere. And in such shitty places, you will sometimes have less than a second to figure out how to go about passing the next skeleton and whether to risk getting hit as you're being chased by a mole. The skeletons like to stand on ledges a lot too, often right next to spikes. No matter how much you've mastered the game, you always somehow get hit by these fuckers. My frustrated wording might be a little deceiving throughout this video, and I apologize. I actually think the physics of this game are great. It adds all the more to that paranoia of making even a single movement, since it could possibly, maybe, perhaps be off by just a little. And so, you get stunlocked. This is pretty much the thesis of Spelunky 2, a single mistake spiraling into the chaos which leads to your death. Whether it's literal in the way that you get thrown into some spikes or more having to do with you getting angry because of that mistake and proceeding to make more, doesn't matter. Getting hit in Spelunky is about as frustrating as anything can be, and I'm not kidding when I say I've probably died as much from suicide by bomb on the first level after getting fucked over too early as I've died naturally. This is why the dwelling is my number one hated zone, it's just the zone in which I've died in the most, though truth be told nothing is quite as annoying as the moles and lizards really. Also, this is definitely the game I've clicked out F4 on the most due to rage, like it happens multiple times every single session I sit down to play Spelunky. But back to stun locking, weren't the totems reserved for the jungle and the golden city? Not anymore, we have them here too now and they'll do their part in fucking you over. And the arrow traps, let's make their placement even worse, let's put some for when you walk sideways so they shoot a mere millisecond after you see them. You could've still reacted fast enough, if you were good enough, which you're not. The arrows can actually be whipped reliably often now, which is so cool each time you do it. It makes you feel like such a master of the game before you've even beaten it. That happens pretty often, you're making virtually no progress rogue likewise, and you don't even seem to be making much when it comes to improving either, but trust me, you are. Progress is slow in this game, you won't be getting out of the second area consistently for a good while. But you will eventually learn that throwing a projectile with a dog causes it to start running, which then allows you to pick it up like that without using a rope, before carrying it to the exit and getting your plus one health. I'll be calling them dogs even though you can change their appearance to a rat or a cat as well. Anyway, you will learn that your whip has a hitbox at the front but also at the back and at the horizontal behind you, which is useful for hitting bats or enemies on ledges. And you can also use it to whip these skeleton walls and only break the top one, allowing you to reach a high place. The same can be done by hopping on enemies and holding jump. You eventually master the timing of throwing a bomb, find out that blowing up or sending turkeys on fire turns them into a plus one health meal, that these hanging fabrics can have spiders or bats hiding behind them, and also learn to actually take the climbing gloves. They are one of the many items carried over from the first game and can be bought from the shops which appear on levels every now and then. One thing I really hate about the shops and some other similar interactions with NPCs is how long the text boxes stay for. It's just a couple of seconds, but in Spelunky all of that time is vital and I kind of can't look down whilst it's there, you know? Anyway, the gloves at first truly seem like the dumbest item of all in the shop. Unless you're taking them every run, it's incredibly hard to get used to. It literally feels like you're covered in super glue. you constantly stick to things you don't want to stick to, way more than you're actually using them to climb up walls in the first place. But as soon as you get proficient at navigating everything as is and decide to finally take them, it's surprisingly easy. There are some actually useless items in the shop though, like for example the web gun. I can't possibly imagine how this could be used in any way whatsoever, I hope it's supposed to be a mocking filler item. Now if you don't have to carry it, sure it would be useful, but you do, you can't pick up rocks and dogs and golden idols which you can give to the shopkeeper or carry to the end of the level for gold, and also the ghost pots. Those are new to Spelunky, and they're one of the most cruelly genius additions I've ever seen in a game. You might have noticed that I mentioned you only have 3 minutes to do each level, 
What that means is that the moment that clock ticks, a ghost will appear and proceed to chase you throughout the level. She one-shots you much like in the first game. However, whilst she was easy to juke by the more skilled players in one, that isn't the case here. The level is already more packed and narrow, but she's also two times faster and will, after another minute, split into two smaller ghosts, with one being even faster, though also only circling the player instead of going for their life. And after 30 more seconds, they split again, now adding a ghost that mirrors the standard one's movements and also one which just flies around randomly in circles but might try and kill you too or mirror another ghost. All of this bullshit prevents the easy juking of the ghost and using her to turn normal gems into diamonds as easily as before. As you might be able to imagine, hitting this 3 minute mark can sometimes mean certain death if you aren't close to the end of the level. You might get cornered, but even if not, you'll still be forced to go way faster, bumping into enemies and traps along the way. The looming fear of the ghost remains present on each and every level, and on its own, even when she's not present, it nonetheless pushes you to hurry. You will never take too long to look down, you will never take too long to wait out enemies. And yet, you're also perfectionist, always trying to get all the money in crates. It's no surprise you make so many mistakes. Spelunky 2 isn't that hard when you can take your time and think through every action, but you can't. I used to hate this aspect of video games. Oh, you're just giving me a time limit so I make mistakes in your otherwise easy game. But it's part of the game here, the most important even. Without it, nothing would really work. It's not something that was added later on, it's what the whole game is built around and if you changed it, you would also necessarily have to change everything else. Oh yeah, back to the ghost spot. Once destroyed, it drops a good amount of cash. However, it also spawns the ghost, no matter what time it is. Okay, just carry it to the end and exit the level immediately. Sure, but easier said than done. It's as fragile as every ordinary pot. Anything that isn't putting it down gently will cause it to shatter immediately. It's such a simple feature, but it works so well on my greedy ass which just can't afford to lose out on that money. And I'd be lying if I said it wasn't worth it for anyone. 20,000 extra gold in the first area alone? Sign me up. And yes, it does get me killed. A lot. It is kind of bullshit sometimes, sadly. If the pot gets thrown at you, you become cursed, your health now reduced to 1, with you unable to increase it until removing the curse. That isn't the easiest thing in the world. There are some more obscure ways, but what you'll be doing most of the time is sacrificing corpses to Kali until she cures you. And you can get this curse in some very stupid ways, like this for example. Really? That's it? My run's over? The ghost spot can also get broken randomly as you enter the level. Again, not very common, but it does happen and can also end your run in seconds. The classic something falls out of your vision and breaks it is more common though. So yeah, that's the ghost spot. But of course it would be too easy if we just ended it there, let's add the key too. It's guaranteed to spawn on either the second or third level of the dwelling and it opens a chest on the same level. The door to the chest can be conveniently placed along your standard route, not that far off from the key, but also sometimes in bumfuck nowhere, right behind the shop is a classic. And of course you only notice it after you've already descended below that part of the floor, so now you have to use a rope and a bunch of bombs to get there. In the room you find the Ujat Eye, or whatever. You don't really know what this item does yet unless you've played Spelunky 1, but it does reveal gems, much like the glasses item. There's so much stuff to move to the end of and around these levels. Ghost pots, golden idols, keys, dogs, turkeys, and they don't all have just one purpose. You can also give the two turkeys to Yang in exchange for some gold or a crate. But I'ma keep it real with you Yang, ain't nobody bringing you them turkeys. Shops and crates aren't the only way to obtain items, we also have the Kali Altars. You can sacrifice any living or dead being that can be picked up upon it and will get rewarded. Some stunnable enemies don't leave corpses and it gives you a time limit, which is cool. And on the other hand, something I hate is how the dogs go into the exit instantly even though you might have been about to sacrifice them. Simply having a button to press so the dog enters when it's you who's carrying it would have fixed that. For your second item, you receive the Kapala. Almost all enemies usually spill some blood when hit, and with this item, it can be collected for HP. It allows you to reach some pretty ridiculous numbers. Adding to the list of cool tricks, you can hit a dog two times before sending it down the exit and get some extra HP that way. You also notice that the critters crawling and flying about the level actually drop some blood too. Sadly, all the items you receive after getting the Kapala simply give you more HP, which is a weird decision to me since you already have all the health in the world. 
Carrying a dog or blowing up a turkey at this point is almost useless, having it give more shop items or at least more bombs and ropes would have been much better in my opinion, for more corpses than before of course. So you're carrying things up and down as well now, and you might be carrying a weapon too, it's hard to describe just how stressful and fast paced this game can be at times with all that stuff when you're trying to be perfect. You always find yourself in these situations where you have 30 seconds left and 3 more trips to do through the floors. Oh yeah, this happens a lot too when you're hurrying, almost every single level has these spikes in one shape or another, and they insta kill you. Always. We're only on the first area, but you can already see how this is not an empowering roguelike such as the Binding of Isaac or Slay the Spire. There is no moment where you're even remotely overpowered or safe. The run can never be secured like with OP builds in the two games I listed, even less so than Into the Breach in which you're already able to die at any moment too. Watch my video on that, by the way. Sure, having 30 health, 50 bombs and ropes, a cape and a badass weapon is more assuring than not, but it's more like going from earning $10 a day to $50 a day rather than $150. Not letting your guard down is a must. You can always fall in spikes, you can always get stunlocked by 10 different things, and you can always blow yourself up, losing 10 points of your health and probably dying since you likely don't have that much to spare. You can always die in a second, and this becomes more and more the case as you get deeper into the dungeons. Speaking of that, the last level of the dwelling is where Quillback dwells. This is a surprisingly simple and easy boss, once again made hard by your own greed and also time limitations. You don't need to kill him, but he gives health and bombs, and he has quite a bit of HP. Unless you have a good weapon or spike shoes, the only real strategy is raining down on him with the skulls above the stairs, or waste a bomb or two. Once you hit him, he starts rolling, and if he hits you in that moment, you're dead. That's it. You've been having an amazing run so far, huh? Well, too bad, you misclicked and didn't jump on that ladder in time, or went a little too low, you're dead, better luck next time, bitch. Dude, fuck this game. Alright, it'll be different this time. After getting past Quillback, you get to choose one of two areas, the jungle or the volcano. On these diverging paths is where you might notice your first example of bullshit in Spelunky 2. The game doesn't forbid enemies from spawning right outside doors and it simply doesn't give you enough time to react. In this case, you can in fact look down and be expecting it, but there also are some absolutely unfair cases in later zones. And not just hit once or twice, stun locked as soon as you enter the door. Another unfair aspect, which is in fact more common, are the scorpions. Scorpions are hell, these guys can sometimes pop out of broken pots and they have the most aggressive behavior in the whole game. The moment you shatter it, they can literally jump and poison you before you could possibly react. Poison can end your run if you aren't doing well in the health department, it makes you lose 1 point every 30 seconds, and if there aren't any dogs around, which are the only antidote for this poison, your death is guaranteed. And there simply isn't enough time and space in this game to throw pots 10 tiles away from you every time. You will get poisoned from the scorpions, in a way that's, in my opinion, bullshit. Finally, for this stage at least, the moment you spawn, young turkeys can immediately die from something that is out of your control, and yet he will still blame you. This is bad, but not quite as much as the same happening with shopkeepers when they get hurt, which is incredibly rare, but can still happen with the arrow traps. But whatever, let's continue with the jungle. You have bear traps which are conveniently hidden behind the decorative bushes and are incredibly hard to spot. They insta kill you. Also, mosquitoes that move in incomprehensible patterns that are too confusing for my monkey brain, they also charge head first at you the moment you lock eyes, good luck with that when you're swinging on the vines over a sea of spikes. Speaking of that, monkeys, they can't actually harm you, but they can stun and throw out your ropes in bundles or your bombs already activated. Oh, and who doesn't like witch doctors? The moment they see you, it's over. You're taking damage no matter what you do. You can interrupt it by hitting them, but the ghostly skull that orbits them will curse you much like the ghost spots the moment you make contact. This is probably the most annoying enemy in the game for me. There's also the annoying spear traps and the thorny vines, which you can safely step on if you have boots. And we have the man traps. They insta kill you. We have cavemen and Aztec cavemen, we have hanging spiders and giant spiders that drop the sticky bomb item. All in all, this zone really is a jungle, it's such pure chaos here, every enemy is so iconic and deadly and it gets even tighter and more difficult to navigate than the level before. What this level shows is that despite the absolute magnitude of this magnificent game, there is no real petty recycling of content throughout the zone, except one. 
There are no risk skins and the enemies that do carry over are merely the most basic ones. And that's only in the first couple of zones. As we get deeper in, the last areas have pretty much nothing in common with the dwelling or joint- wait, what's this? Nice. Welcome to the black market. This is basically what you've been taking time to pick up gold and idols and ghost spots for, mostly. You can buy almost everything you want here. You made it, with probably very few bombs and ropes, on most runs anyway. But you can now get dozens of each if you did well with your money. It's the one place where you feel completely safe during the whole game. You get that 4 leafed clover for free which pushes back the ghosts with 2 minutes. You have all the time in the world to just chill and browse items. As long as you don't attack the shopkeepers or you didn't earlier. That will make all of them hostile to you and one will always wait for you by the exit of the level. Depending on your crime you can get forgiven after some time but be careful. This guy's AI is insane. I mean, it's the same as Yang, but he doesn't have an overpowered shotgun. There's also the hedget up for taking here, though you don't know what it's for yet either. But I don't even care about the black market, what about the Volcana? This other path is about as different as can be. It's for one very open, but insta-killing lava flows everywhere, only giving you more space to fuck up since you can take some fall damage and tumble all the way into your death. Magmars jump out of the lava as you're passing by, imps drop pots filled with them on your head, platforms fall down the moment you touch them, explosive power boxes are buried in the ground, and there are spike balls which activate the moment you pass under them trying to crush you. And on top of all that you have conveyors pulling you left and right to disorient you even more. Volcana might seem easier at first since it gives you more space, but as you can figure out through all the threats I listed, this level manages to produce that same feeling of unsafety and being able to slip up at any moment. Only this time it's not because you have nowhere to move, but because you have nowhere to hide. That's the agoraphobia. It's often hard to return the same way you came unless you have a ton of ropes. You can always be attacked from anywhere and you can always throw a bomb just a little too close to the lava and screw up your exit. Having all these different levels and variety, and trust me, there's a lot more coming, is really overkill. I'd been having so much fun for my first 70 hours of this game until I beat it that I didn't even realize I had been doing pretty much the same exact route each and every time. Yes, it's easier to master it and beat the game that way, but it shows just how fun the game is on its own. Spelunky 1 had a mere two routes and they only diverged at the end of the first route, depending on if you had the special item. But it was still incredibly fun. The fact that this one has so much variety makes me really, really happy. I'm looking at you Hades, pretty good game, but only four areas and still being that hacky and slashy? Really? Anyway, by this point you've probably gotten at least one deep level. Your voice echoes in here. Upon hearing those words you know you're in for something. Although the total rooms of the level are more than twice as many as usual, your time is not increased whatsoever. And you can still have dogs, keys, idols and so on to carry. These levels are both a curse and a blessing, much like the dark levels since you can get so much gold. Though I do think adding a single extra 30 seconds or maybe a minute would have been fine. It's always so shitty when your turkeys and Kaliata and Ujatai chest are all on the same level and it happens to be a big one. Instead of the black market, in the volcano we have Vlad's castle. It's found by activating this big ass drill with the Ujatai and descending all the way down the level. Once you arrive, you'll find a bunch of hide hands and vampires, and most importantly, Vlad. He is not the easiest enemy to kill, but shouldn't be a problem with all the help you have. If you rescued Van Horsing back at the first level of Volcana, he'll just one shot him. Once he's dead, you get his cape, which gives you the glide ability, obviously, but also an extra jump, and it doubles the blood that enemies drop, which is OP as fuck for the Kapala. You might think this place isn't worth it and does Volcana as a whole, but there are other ways to get bombs and ropes and all the items from the black market. You can't get this cape anywhere else, and it's undoubtedly the best back item. And of course, you get an item identical to the hedget here too, you don't even have to worry about having enough money to buy it. So now you have 4 Hyatt hands on your hands, and yes that is the correct way to put it, very much so. Whilst these guys are very helpful in a game where you're usually alone and every enemy is designed to focus on you and only you, 
they're all so fucking crazy. They'll pick up and throw anything, accidentally attack NPCs whilst finding out something else, and even murder you in seconds after getting in your face and being surprised that you hit them in the process. Not to mention all the ridiculous ways they pace around and die randomly from lava and spikes. This insanity is actually a good addition in my opinion, since they'd just be overpowered otherwise. It's kind of a risk or reward situation, not to mention they're hilarious as hell the way they are. Anyway, neither the Volcana nor the Jungle have a boss on their 4th level like the Dwelling does. However, this is what you see as soon as you enter the next area. This is just giant nostalgia for Spelunky 1, and out of nowhere since we expect Olmec to be at the end of stage 4 like in the first game. The first phase of the boss remains exactly the same, but in the second, stuff starts to diverge from the original fight. There isn't lava where he falls, there's a second floor. Olmec transforms and starts flying, raining down bombs if you try to get under him to break his glass balls. He stops after 3 times though. Very rarely he does 6 times, or maybe even more. Not sure if that's a bug or a feature, but it is surely annoying and stupid when it happens for the first time on your 30th Olmec fight, out of nowhere. When you do manage to break the glass, he just falls and breaks a few tiles and starts flying again. After getting him to the third stage this way, you can finally see the lava. This is the last stage. He works like in the first phase, but also spawns UFOs, so you can't do it the easy way. This phase is fucking scary. Although Olmec can just kill you without stomping down first, which you can always react to with ease, you can get crushed between him and a wall, which isn't as rare as you may like to imagine. It's always nerve-wracking, slowly getting closer and closer to make him jump. This boss is like most Spelunky bosses. It's easy, but the stakes are incredibly high. It's been, what, 15 minutes of a probably good run? It'd be a shame to die like an idiot now, right? If you jump on top of Olmec in the lava, you can get the Ankh like in the original game, an extra life. Surprisingly, even though it looks like it, you can't miss the door no matter where Olmec falls, which is nice. Stage 4 is the real divergence from the first game. From here on out, we start getting new zones, ones which we are completely unfamiliar with, like... The Tide Pool, which is definitely, without a doubt, one of the areas in Spelunky. <laughs> Okay, there is some cool stuff here. Level 1 always has Madame Tusk's dice house. It's a dice house, like the others you could have found up until now. You just roll for items and gold. On level 2 you can find the Stars Challenge, wherein you ought to light all the torches in a limited amount of time, which grants you a clone gun with 3 shots. It clones enemies, items, pets and so on. You will also find Excalibur in the Tide, which can be pulled out only if you have the crown or hedget. It's like a machete, but with a shit ton more damage. Finally, level 3 is where the most interesting part is. There is a huge lake of lava at the bottom of the level, which at first comes off as just another of the many ways to die. However, you eventually come across this door, and upon entering you may descend all the way down and under the lava. There is no way to go back up, all you can do is take this idol and die. Nice! A cool trick is leaving your items at the door, including whatever you're carrying on your back, but a way cooler trick is this one. Yeah, you don't actually need to use up the Ankh or even have it in the first place, though it's always useful since this can still happen. I really wish to always discover these things on my own and make sure I found everything I'll find before googling stuff, but I'm sadly too lazy sometimes. After entering the door hidden in the lava, you come across this cool looking turtle person. You can kill him in a number of ways, but using the OP sword is a pretty easy solution. Not much else than spamming involved in this, which is a shame. This guy is pretty boring, and this sub area as a whole, and the entire tight pool area. Yeah, sorry, it's not the best looking and definitely not with the most engaging enemies. It mostly recycles stuff from the older zones and not even in a cool or original way. It's the only area that does this. We've seen the undead before, we've seen the enemies that become sonic when they see you, we've seen the bear and tiki traps and the spikes. The crabs are cool for sure, but they're also very obvious most of the time. This area just doesn't come together with an idea in the same way all the others do. It's the blandest one in the game when it comes to design. And I know visuals aren't the most important thing to a majority of the players, especially ones playing a platform with this art style, but they are important to me and this area just looks like shit. I'm guessing I'm the only one, but for some reason I just inexplicably despise this area's color palette. 
Now, the other area you could have chosen, the Temple of Anubis, is way cooler. They brought it over from the original game, though it's been changed a little. For starters, this area does look fucking amazing. In fact, it's probably my favorite one, so let's talk a little about the graphics. The first game looked good for 2009, excluding the color palette, which really wasn't my favorite. Everything is so incredibly bright and vibrant, it hurts my eyes to just look at screenshots of this shit. I have no idea how I actually played it back in the day. Now, Spelunky 2, this game is clean as fuck. It isn't lifeless to me, like some people say, it's bland in a good way, everything looks smooth. I love visuals like this, and as a bonus, I can always tell what's going on. While we're on this, yes, the soundtrack is good too. I've probably played with music in like 1% of my runs, I usually play my own musical podcasts, but from what I've heard of it, it's pretty catchy, and it doesn't distract you or anything, it's good focusing music. But back to the tempo, more importantly, not only does the area look cool, but its design is also great. It's kind of like a toned down version of the Volcana, one that's just as little but a little more closed in. There are these cubes flying straight at you when you're close and parallel, similarly to the spike balls but from any direction now. They blend into the environment and there are also the absolute unit versions, which are terrifying. You have to do some quick math and planning when there are a lot of them in your path to figure out how you'll get through. It's a very stressful zone, as if these crush traps weren't enough, which they really are, we also have enemy summoning sorceresses and necromancers, crazy crocmen, mummies, and cat mummies, which curse you upon contact. There's quicksand, and then there's Anubis. He can be killed pretty easily with sticky bombs, but the weapon he drops is just insane. It will pretty much stun lock and insta kill anything upon contact, but it can also hurt you. It deals 10 damage on each hit. That's how much a bomb deals. On this level, you will also find Van Horsing once again. This time, he will give you his alien compass. I guess that's just a normal compass or something. On your second tempo level, you'll also notice a suspicious door of solid gold standing menacingly. If you're still carrying the scepter and also have either the hedget or crown from earlier, you'll be allowed to pass through. This level is 5x5 five five instead of 4x4, four four, and it's all made of solid gold blocks upon which even more golden scarabs crawl. The level has a lot of leprechauns, guaranteeing you can easily get the 4-leaf clover and increase your time by 2 minutes, and also reveal the many pots of gold scattered around the level. Most importantly, you find this unusual looking altar. It works like a normal one, but like the ankh on the head of the bull implies, upon sacrificing yourself on the altar with the ankh, you will instead be transported in a different area entirely. Welcome to Duat. This is the parallel level to Abzu, but way cooler. The floor is reversed in that you ought to make your way up the level rather than down. There really aren't many scary enemies here, green and red snakes and the new Omit, which are very easy to farm for blood for the Kapala. You just gotta watch out and not get stunlocked. There's some lava here, but not much. Naturally, the Egyptian god of chaos, Apep, is also here, passing through the level a total of two scripted times. It'll probably catch you off guard the first instance, but when you learn you have infinite time for this level, the giant snake and the whole area in fact become trivial. Spelunky just isn't very interesting if the ghost isn't there, when it comes to normal floors of course. Bosses are a different story, it would work with super hard levels too. The snake isn't used properly in this area, it will kill you the first time and never again unless you're speedrunning or something. Ironically, making the level normal with you descending down as usual would have probably been harder since climbing up to escape the sudden snake is more difficult than just dropping down in a reverse level. At the top you can find the Anubis 2, which isn't surprising considering he had the Ankh as well. And also Ceres. This boss has more in-depth mechanics than Kengu, he's kind of like Homek. You need to pass under him to harm him, this time with bombs, but then he does the attack. Wow! And he also destroys blocks, which means you eventually have nowhere to go but... down there. If you take too long, but hopefully you kill him after throwing a bunch of bombs, get the tablet and make your way out. Here's the problem the way I see it with choosing this path back in Omek's room. The tempo is hard as fuck, but you don't really get anything extra for coming here. If you're not that good at the game and you've been going through fire and water to reach this part, playing for more than 20 minutes on top of all the failed runs you had before, what exactly compels you to go anywhere but up zoo? You get to keep your back item and weapon there, but not here. Well, you can give them to the Waddler back in Omek's lair, who carry them for you to the ice caves, but that means you'll be empty handed and vulnerable for the already hard temple area. But even excluding that, you get to keep your rank if you do the skipping tide, but not here. You get to keep all your resources when killing the boss, but not here. You get the clone gun, but not here. 
Yeah, this area is way cooler than Tide, undoubtedly, but that's even worse since I still never went here at first despite wanting to. I'm not about to waste my good run, I'll do anything to increase my odds of winning, it's not like they're that high in the first place. I guess they might have wanted a hard and easy route in the game, but I still would have preferred to have two somewhat balanced areas to choose between first, like with the jungle and volcano. Some might see my criticizing of Duat for kind of being too easy as weird since I also claim the path itself is too hard, but that's only compared to Tide, where the secret zone is even easier. The fifth area, the Ice Caves, is a brief respite from the dangers that have passed and still await, once again taken over from the first game. But you shouldn't let your guard down even here, it's a single but large level and it's not that hard at first to get flung across the map by a yeti and fall on top of a landmine or straight down into the infinite abyss or just getting stun locked into the wall, that still happens to me. These yetis are the biggest threat here really, but we also have UFOs, ceiling spikes, which are really cool, and the mech rider, which is fucking scary. You can actually use the armor as a mount if you kill the alien. I like this area for what it is, though there really isn't anything special here, unless you did the little Van Horsing side quest and got the compass, of course. It points to the alien mothership deep into the, I guess, not empty abyss. Its entrance is just outside your view. It's not a very big area since its timer is tied to that of the already longer than usual ice caves. There's just the giant alien here and these weird zombie dudes, which are actually the shopkeepers. Yeah, there is an explanation as to why they all look the same and have pretty much superhuman strength and speed. They're all made here. At the top can be found what is dubbed the original man. Make of that what you will. Finally, you'll find the plasma cannon. This can rarely be found in caveman shops, in caves, ton shops and even crates, but this is the only reliable way to get it. Make acquaintance with the most powerful weapon in the game. Yeah, it just shoots explosive missiles with a little cooldown, there is no catch. As long as you're careful, nothing can stop you, it doesn't run out, it doesn't break unless you explode it, it's just a cool fucking weapon. Fuck. That wasn't a bug, I guess the coffin is a solid object, which is kind of weird, but what about some actual performance issues and bugs? There's only two I've seen, one, this thing that happens with the rope, for some reason it sometimes takes the length that the rope is supposed to be and where it would stop if it was placed under a ledge, and yet it does it next to the ledge where it should otherwise continue. I hope that made sense. Maybe this is from putting it exactly in the middle? I don't know. And 2 is way worse, if you alt tab a couple of times quickly to maybe pause a song and go back to the game and alt tab again to see something on discord and then go back, your game will freeze visually and all you'll see is a snapshot of that pause screen without being able to move or even alt tab out of the game. You can still hear the game since it's all visual, but all you can do is close it. And the reason for why that is terrible is you can't save. Yeah, really, you can't do anything but forfeit your run when you have to turn off your computer or close the game, and runs can be an hour plus long. I'm honestly more mad about this than the glitch itself, this is by far the dumbest feature in the whole game and I'm bewildered as to why they could have chosen it, I can't even begin to imagine what upside or reasoning there is for it. Even if crashes, glitches and windows updates didn't exist, this is still a terrible feature. Anyway, the next level. New Babylon is the futuristic city of high technology within which the aliens and all mites clash, and it really lives up to that concept. It's a damn battlefield where you have no freaking idea of what is what the first couple of times you walk in. You just get shot at immediately, your jetpack explodes and you start all over again. That's the furthest I ever made it. Or will. For a long time. That was my best run. It's one of the hardest areas there is, employing the same calculative aspect like the Temple of Anubis as you try to work out how you're going to pass through everything before your time runs out. There are the force fields, which we haven't seen yet implemented in an actual level besides the mothership. Again, you ought to be aware of how your bombs are going to affect these as they can open up more space for the laser and block you off. There are the laser traps, which are arrow traps, but 10 times faster and they shoot indefinitely. Even worse are the spark traps, around which these balls fly, possibly colliding not only with you, but also UFOs and other explosive shit, turning the place into even more of an unpredictable war zone. However, by far the most dangerous are the elevators, for me. They can be useful, but not enough to make up for the danger they present when it comes to crushing you. And of course, they put them in a level where I have so much to worry about already. You will just be walking through what seems like a harmless part of the level and then... 
If you remember the so-called Tablet of Destiny you picked up, it can now finally be used. On the second floor of New Babylon you'll find a giant room with 100 of these figurines. The correct one is random on every run, and the only way to know which it is, is with the tablet. It will update its description each time, you still gotta search a little to find it. If you got the correct one, this happens when you exit the floor. This is the Quillen, and it's the most OP mount in the game, it can just fly indefinitely. That's it, it doesn't explode or kill you or anything, just an OP mount you worked for, good job. Level 4 of New Babylon is always the fight with Queen Tiamat. Again a pretty underwhelming one for Spelunky, you use a weapon if you have one, throw bombs otherwise, that's it. When you kill her you get to pass through and that's the game. The end. But is it? Yes, it's the normal ending, not to be confused with the hard ending or the special ending. Oh god. So using the Quillen you can fly above Tiamat's throne and find this section of the level that is impossible to reach otherwise. They made her blow harmless bubbles which you can hop on top of to see what's up and thus find this place naturally. Although if you're like me you probably concluded that this is part of the boss fight and you need to reach it or at least you can which still means I should so you get to Tiamat again and again and just try and get up there with ropes and a jetpack and a perfectly timed bubble and yeah I should just google stuff even more often. Not going to blame the bubbles for this one, but a lot of people probably die here, like instantly on their first time. You can't take your quillin past this point, though it doesn't matter since it isn't of much use for what's coming. The sunken city is really fucking cool, no not that one. The area looks great and its design is like in Abzu, it's reversed. This zone is supposed to catch you off guard, I think, but in a roundabout way. It does so because there are actually very few surprising things here. You've been playing the game a lot to get so far, you know how to adapt by this point. You've seen arrow traps before, they're just poisonous here. You've seen skulls, but they fall on your head now. You've seen water, only it's been inverted. You're so far into the game and you should be very careful, but when you enter, it's weirdly quiet and easy. And so you let your guard down. Finally, another brief respite. Sure, there are these scary big bugs every now and then, but that's it. Seemingly all. Yes, when these regenerative blocks regenerate and you are inside one of them, you die. Instantly. It doesn't happen often, so when it does, you have no idea what just happened for the first couple of seconds. Or what about this one? And the icing on the cake, this fucking boss, you better be playing with your volume up or else you'll fall behind by the time you notice he's here and chasing you up the level. It takes so long to get to this place and so they didn't make it as incredibly unpredictable as the jungle or temple, but in the way you explained it achieves the same thing nonetheless. Anyhow, this boss is probably the most engaging one in the entire game and it's of course the boss that's still all about the level and you needing to go faster through it. I think it's pretty clear by this point that Spelunky wasn't made for bosses. After you reach the arena at the top of the floor, you wait for him a little, throw two bombs at each of his heads as he's shooting these laser things and then make your way out of the sunken city. That's it, you did it, hard ending, done. And I'm sorry, but my Spelunky 2 journey, at least for this video, ends here. There are still three things I am just too bad and lazy, but can still do, if I had the time. And this video needs to come out eventually. Remember that this is coming from somebody that has already played the game for a total of 133 hours, mostly between the uploading of my latest video and this one. Firstly, do the stealing quest. You need to steal from a shopkeeper, meet with Sparrow, who will challenge you to steal the idol from Madame Tusk's dice house, meet with Sparrow again in New Babylon, and finally steal from Madame Tusk again, together. And you get half the treasure. This is cool, especially for getting high scores, but I'm gonna do it later. Secondly, complete the Cosmic Ocean. You need to take the hard route, getting the ball from the first challenge in stage 2, give it to the jelly guy who will carry it for you to the sunken city, where you'll pick it up, get the sun arrow from the third challenge, shoot it into Han Dan's eye, and enter the Cosmic Ocean. I've gotten as far as the level before Han Dan, but I don't think the delaying of this video will be worth the dozens of hours I know I'll spend trying to get to the ridiculous 94 levels of the Cosmic Ocean, are you fucking serious? From what I know, it's an extremely dangerous abomination of warped versions of previous levels, with no shopkeepers, ghost spots, altars or docks. The levels loop back in on themselves both horizontally and vertically, which means you can walk left forever and keep going through the screen, or fall down forever and keep seeing the same floors. There are three orbs on each level that you need to break so that this monster moves out of the exit and lets you pass, only now it's chasing you, and it one-shots you. 
Yeah, gonna do that eventually, but definitely not now. And thirdly, reach the eggplant world. To give a present to Kali to receive an eggplant, put it on the purple altar in the ice caves and rescue the eggplant child, carry it to this other altar in the sunken city and enter the eggplant world. Everything is passive here and there isn't much interesting other than the dormant eggplant king or as he was known previously in Spelunky 1, King Yama, the king and final boss of the first game's hell area, which was a hard ending, like Sunken City in this one. I guess he was canonically killed with an eggplant? What you get for killing him again, this time with one hit, is some screaming about eating your vegetables, a lot of eggplant flesh for health, 100 plus exactly, which is more than you ever need, and the eggplant crown that replaces your whip attack with an infinite supply of eggplants you can throw like rocks. Again, this is an area that's extremely difficult to get to and probably doesn't provide much insight. I can already imagine how annoying carrying the eggplant child will be in the future, knowing that it has the insane AI of a hard at hand. But I'm very happy there is a second very hard challenge to do in the already ridiculously hard Spelunky 2. I hope no one's mad I didn't do these things, but this was originally supposed to be a quick analysis of why this game's design is so good and why you should play it, like my Into the Breach video, but of course it turned into another mini behemoth essay. Sorry about that. I really don't have much else profound or interesting to say about this game, it's the platform I've played the most in my life and probably my personal favorite. It's also the most punishing game I've ever played and I've never seen anything quite like it other than Spelunky 1 I guess, though as we said even that game doesn't compare to this one's ridiculousness. Spelunky 2 is just a really fun and stressful and well designed fucking... Fuck! 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 Oh fuck! 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 Mid 9 out of 10. Hey, thank you for watching this video. Make sure to ring the bell, share, like, comment, watch my other videos, and all of that. Check out my waiting list if you're interested. It's where I score and write down my brief thoughts on anything and everything that I watch, play, and so on. I also keep on my video ideas and what I'm currently working on there. It's linked on my channel. And as always, subscribe if you like this type of content and want to see more of it. Thanks for sticking around, and I'll see you in the next video.